My name is Tammy Lee Meyer, and welcome to a collaboration conversation with Arthur Brock and Daniel Harris. Thank you both for joining. Oh, thanks. Uh, yes. Oh, and the cat wants to. Uh, the cat wants to also say hi. <laughs> Uh, so we just wanted to start today by really landing in what brings us to our work. And maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, I'm really inspired by change makers like yourselves that are building things that can help us to transition to a new economy, a commons, and to create tools that we can use to make that transition. And one of the things that I see is that we're not as connected as we need to be. And so I'm, I'm really excited to bring people together, uh, to listen and share and understand uh, some of the goals, uh, the future that we're moving towards, and to be able to track that process as we, as we develop it together. Um, and I think that um, the world needs us. We're in a, we're in a pretty intense time uh, in terms of crisis and each one of us brings something to the table. So I feel that it's of value for us to share what we're doing and to uh, invite people to participate. Mm -hmm. So that's what brings me to this work. And I'll pass it over to you, Daniel. So why am I here? What am I doing? Um, what brings you to your work? Brings me to my work? Uh, it's probably a real hate of moaning. <laughs> and, and I just had enough of people moaning and I want things to work better. And... Um, and I, th I guess I see a lot of duplication of energy, a lot of uh, yeah, resources being wasted, human resources being wasted as well. And just looking for ways that we can make all the boring stuff more efficient so we can get on, get on with uh, having fun and celebrating life. And I think that's the kind of main motivation for what, what's going on with, with me. Yeah. Awesome. Arthur. Mm, what brings me to this work is um, I think uh, a, a vision or inspiration about what is possible in um, in new ways of being with each other, new patterns of of being, new patterns of organizing ourselves that that we as as sort of prideful, big-brained creatures, we, we look at ourselves on the top of this sort of ladder of evolution and don't notice that we are already cells in larger organisms called corporations and governments and all that kind of stuff, but that the cells in our body are smarter than us in most ways when it comes to building these next-level things, right? That so far our big crowning achievement in building these social organisms is corporations that operate as cancers and eat their environment <laughs> and you know, their communities and and uh, and are stuck in a feedback loop of just grow, grow, grow. And you know, uh, for me, I see us on this cusp, this edge, this critical juncture of um, of collective intelligence, of human evolution, and being able to take a quantum leap to the next stage of these things. And I see things emerging with technology um, that allow us to hold new patterns that without the, the problems of centralization that lead to a lot of those other patterns and, and a lot of the problems of those patterns. And I don't know, I just, for me, it's just like, we have to, we, we there's like this, this moment of we either eat our planet and cause serious problems for our, our species and others, or we, we learn how to organize ourselves in new ways. And I vote for number two there. Me too. <laughs> yes. 
thank you. And, and that leads us into the vision for the future, because I wanted us to each kind of share when our, when our projects are out in the world and done and dusted, uh, what are the changes that we, what's our vision? What's the changes that we'd like to see on the ground? Um, I'm happy to start. Uh, so um, I would, there's a few different pieces that I'm working with. Uh, this uh, collaboration, uh, documented collaboration space and creating media that is uh, generative and we don't quite know where we're going, but we're, we're, we're collaborating and finding our path. I see that as a really next level way to organize uh, as well as allowing us to be able to choose what it is that we're working on, what it is we want to say, who it is we want to work with, and really give us agency in terms of creating what we'd like to create in real time with other people. Uh, so I see a, um, an ongoing documentary, essentially, of us creating media that allows us to see what each other are doing and participate in the ways that make sense. Uh, and I see uh, also a new framework for, for copyright. Uh, I <clears throat> The rights-based copyright is something that I think holds a lot of challenges for us. So when I speak of copyright, I spell it differently, as in copyright, W-R-I-T-E, as in all of the stuff of the cultural commons is fair game. We write our reality by interacting with it. And in so doing, we create our future. And so it's an active and generative mashup of all that we've ever known and done. And so different ways of attributing and of, uh, of uh, making agreements about how media is shared and, and uh, distributed is, you know, I'm not quite sure where it's going because it takes participation with people to decide what that might look like. Uh, but those are some of the some of the some of the pieces that, uh, in looking into the future, when uh, this work is more active and people are really working with these kinds of ideas, that uh, we'll be able to have more agency in what we talk about, a space and place to be able to collaborate and participate together and a developing um, real-time story that emerges from that. Mm. Mm. That's the hope. Right. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, just one little thought on that. The, the, the whole thing of telling stories while they emerge, like being able to, to do the sense-making while it's all unfolding and um, with the with the levels of complexity that we have happening in the world sometimes that's really challenging and so yeah we need people making these connections and helping do the sense making while it's happening while it's happening and because these are media pieces that can be viewed afterwards i i see that people will be able to interact asynchronistically with information and the important thing for me is to tie things together and to continue that conversation so yes in real time and those are like building that capacity to understand with it's like i see it as a pipe like building our ability to widen our pipe uh i think that's a capacity we need to learn and we can learn from people like you arthur who has this real gift for seeing complex systems and uh and and so yeah i think we're it's a place where we can and need to grow yeah do you want to jump in daniel okay um yeah what's it look like in the future uh, uh i suppose it's what i what i want to contribute and where do I see the, the, the pain points are? I see a lot of good work being carried out in terms of um, leveling the playing field. Lots of re 
really good ideas and um, good implementations. And I suppose having been on this train for like 20 odd years since I really connected with the internet and open protocols, um, I've gone round, round the circle of trying to get people to, trying to get commercial organizations to, to um, actually interconnect and interoperate. And I think um, that, so what I'd like to see is interoperability at every level. And, and so that's kind of, okay, well, yeah, we can do that. So, but, but I guess how that then looks is that people have the, individuals have the freedom to just move wherever they want, connect with whoever they want. Um, if everything is an open protocol, if every language is an open protocol, if, if every function is an open protocol, then you're not tied into any particular system. Um, and um, be it friending someone, you don't need Facebook, you can just friend them like you would send them an email, you know, or, 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 or catching a, a lift. Uh, you don't need um, a lift share company to do that. It just, you just connect into the lift, lift ride share cloud, you know, and, and so every strata, even decision making, even governments, even, you know, so, so really what I'd like to see is every individual being autonomous uh, to make, like you were saying as well, make choices about who they want to be and what they want to contribute. And to the naysayers that we, we can't give people that kind of level of choice right now. And, and, and right, right now we probably, it, we could, but it probably, things would mess up, but, but I think things will evolve. So technology will evolve, Function, functionality will evolve, freedom will evolve. And by the time we're there, and hopefully it's very soon, um, people will have evolved. So people will not stay the same. I think that's one thing I really want to push into these kind of conversations is people will evolve too and people will take on more responsibility. And actually, that's what I want to see. So yes, people might say, sorry, I'm sort of quoting people. <laughs> Some people might say, um, uh, like, it's not in human nature. And I, I just think, well, you know, uh, that's what schools are for. That's what teaching is for. You know, we change how people behave. And, 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 and in a sense, it is a very, um, it's pushing it out in order to create safety. That's what this is about. It's ordered, in order to you know, have a safe world, we need to push that. And therefore, we can't just let things happen. We actually have to foist open protocols or whatever, you know, interoperability or, you know, autonomy onto people. You are responsible for your lives. So that's the kind of, yeah, that's the kind of world I'd like to see. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah, for, for me, connected to that precipice that I think we're on the edge of um, it has to do with these new patterns of opening things up into um, decentralized ways. Now, most people's exposure to that so far is the blockchain, right? But the blockchain mm -hmm. for me is still far too centralized in architecture, and so far, far too centralized. Like we think of it as a big monolithic global ledger. Now there's lots of copies of it, which makes it complicated to, to manage. But for me, the, the things that we're building with Scepter and with Holochain um, are, are to be able to push that out to the edges and create many, many new patterns of organizing. I think of it like, a, like the Cambrian explosion of life forms with the advent of, of DNA, all of a sudden multicellular life could organize in all these different ways and, and nature tried lots of different things. Now, a lot of those things didn't work out. Mm. But the ones that did gave us the whole kind of richness of species we have today. And I feel like we're about to be at that kind of transition point for social organisms. That as we, when we put this kind of tool out there, it becomes the social DNA. It becomes the, 
the means by which we can create new social patterns and there's going to be an explosion of them. And I don't know that we have to foist it on them or program kids in school or anything like that. I think what's going to happen is some of these are going to outcompete the command control corporate hierarchies that are really not efficient either and outcompete, you know, the commercial market economies. We've got this religion about, about that the market makes good decisions. The market is really efficient. But if that were true, we would use the market in our homes and we would charge our kids for the dinners and we gift economies are so many orders of magnitude more efficient than market economies, commercial economies. And yet we just sort of blinders, you know, ignore all this kind of stuff. And I think as we activate these new patterns, Mm. as we have the technology for non-local information sharing, so no de completely decentralized uh, in that sense, um, all of these new patterns just explode and um, they, they outcompete the old power structures because they, they have that, that magic of kind of, of biological life, of organic life and are more resilient and adaptive. And so being able to move toward the kind of ubiquitous interoperability that you're talking about, Daniel, you know, like we didn't even set out, we wanted, we were setting out to, for composability. We wanted to be able to mash things up together effectively. Mm -hmm. And what we discovered in the process of doing that, we built, we ended up building semantics into a really low level and, and doing that gave us a, a universal protocol parser, you know, that was, at first we had no idea how to build that. And then suddenly we had one and, and mm -hmm. because of, coming in kind of through the back door and, right. and uh, it just, yeah, to me, I'm just so present to the future that unfolds with this and how quickly yeah. things will change um, and mm. people will change, but um, how quickly we will replace governments and nation states and that type of stuff. <laughs> they, are, they are industrial age machines, sure. not yeah. information age organisms, yeah. you know, and, Awesome. While, while you were saying that, I, I, I uh, was thinking, uh, provide the tools to let people self-organize. And that's, that's kind of, uh, we're on the same, we're on the same. And that's kind of just, they will, yeah, they will just, it will flower. Because when I, when I ran an ISP back in the mid nineties, it was TCP IP. It was just like, we could just connect in. It was like, wow, you know, we're running an internet company. Wow. Like the big guys. And it didn't, there was no difference. And it's kind of that level playing field. Yeah. So, Yes, let's do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yes, mm. and here we are. Mm. Um, I'd love for us to do a bit of an overview on what some of what we're each bringing to the table. Uh, so yeah. we can get a little bit specific about that. For me, mm. um, this kind of process, this open and generative conversation process, uh, where we're able to, to um, go on a learning journey together, I'm personally on, on a path of inquiry. I'm on a quest. I see so many people that are out there doing really powerful things and what's missing is that they're not seen or heard. What you need to do to be able to have someone seen or heard really in that kind of full organism way is to have listeners. Uh, so I'm a listener as well as a collaborator. And uh, what's I think different as well about this kind of thing is that we're all, uh, we're all equal, we're peers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not trying to uh, extract value from either of you. I'm looking to generate value collaboratively. And so there's the value that we create in the moment by what it is to actually connect on that human level. Uh, and to see how closely, like it's really inspiring to hear what you guys are working on and your dreams and visions for the future and what brings you to the work. And um, all of that allows me to understand, ah, yes, we are in this together and there are specific ways that we can help each other. So there's that value on a human level, like just in this now moment. Um, and then from, from there, there's other metrics of value, like 
we can share what we're doing. We can make people aware of how they can participate and how they can collaborate uh, to, to, oh, you're muted. It's all good. It's fine. Uh, oftentimes in my space, because I live with so many people, there's people kind of coming and going. It's just part of the, <laughs> part of it. We are embedded in the realities that we're in and they're interpenetrative interpenetrative it's all happening uh, so in terms of in terms of uh, my work uh, I am it's it's these kinds of conversations and processes to be able to give people spaces to share their work and to look at how we can we can share that together as a as a live recorded piece that is then shared with others later as we decide as we choose and as makes sense uh, it's also, I think, important for us to be, to design and strategize that, that piece in terms of who does this need to be in front of? Who would be helped by knowing this and in what order of events does that, does that make sense to bring people into the conversation? Uh, mm -hmm. and that's, I think, um, there's an organicness to what that is, uh, but it's important for us to think into that together as well. I have some I have some new ideas around copyright, and I I think that um, how we this is us and our this is a representation this media is a represent representation of our identity. Uh, there's also information and data, and uh, I think we need to think into how we how we are in relationship with cultural works like this that uh, are out in the world and separate from us, but are representing us. And so I'm looking forward to having conversations with people about what that is and how that can shift in this kind of new paradigm of being uh, in terms of collaboration and building the kinds of systems and protocols that we need to build. Uh, so that's, that's a couple of the pieces, like all of us, uh, we're full humans with a lot of different pieces that we bring. Um, but I feel like in terms of today, that's a great place for me to start. Um, and of course, there's, there's more. <laughs> I'm also a systems thinker and, and, uh, and I'm deeply embedded in a number of different kinds of movements, change movements, and so, um, connecting those change movements together is one of the pathways forward, I think. So that's me. Daniel, did you want to jump in? What's the, sorry, what's the question we're answering? Ah, yes. Overview of our projects. Mm. So those are, those are a couple of the big ticket projects that are really relevant in our conversation today. Yeah. So the project that what I'm, I'm working on several things, but the project that's relevant here really is uh, Kendra IO. And um, I wouldn't be really having this conversation unless I just got the promise of some funding for the next three years from the EU. So that's kind of the big news. Um, the, the project runs on funding. I, if, if it's not funded, then it will trickle along and I'll keep the, the momentum going. But when we get funding, then we can really do some damage. So just some numbers, because I'm pretty impressed by them. It's, it's the most money we've ever had. So it's about 500 odd thousand euro over three years. We're one of a consort, one member of a seven member consortium uh, that has 2.7 million uh, euro over the next three years. And it, w what dawned on me was that it's not just our bit of the pie that, that we have access to, it's actually other members of the consortium are working in collaboration with us on building collaborative software and to, to lesser or greater degree. And so there's even more resources available to us. So I'm kind of jumping for joy on that. Um, so the, the, the wider scope of Kendra is basically to harmonize um, 
the distribution of media. And copyright was actually a recent, when I say recent, about four years ago, we started looking at copyright. But before that, it was really about making it easier for artists to get their content out there and also find out who's, who's using their content. But, but I think the music industry in particular has gone through a big mind shift recently. What, not exactly because of blockchain, around the same time as blockchain came in, into field, um, a lot of new ideas were happening and a lot of more people have been talking about harmonizing and protocols and making things work better. And the EU actually funded trying to get all of the data into one place that failed. That was the Global Re Repertoire Database, GRD. And so what, what, what Kendra's remit is, is to try and foster a, an open protocol around media and copyright. And as I said before, uh, it's, it's my particular passion is not just having the technology, but is having a route to get adoption because you can have awesome technology and it just doesn't get adopted. Like there's loads of stuff in the W3C that is just not being adopted. <laughs> and so the strategy, and this is how it has, it's changed, evolved. You know, I started off by getting people into a room and saying, can you build an open protocol, please? And they didn't know what I was talking about. So I have to, had to build something. And so we're building a kind of, what we've built so far is, 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 an, is a kind of a prototype application that shows a song and a timeline and, and samples within that song. And you can take a sample from that song and put it into another song and the copyright information the ownership and the credit information goes with that song into a new song. And then you can have a song full of samples and the samples can be nested. So, and you end up with a menu of who was part of it. So in a sense, what we built is an interface to build a smart contract, whether that smart contract ends up in a blockchain or whether it ends up in some other system, I don't care. In fact, I want to end it to end up in all of them, you know, um, so really, I'm looking at the interface between the person, the people, the managers, the record labels, the, even the PROs and the CMOs, the copyright protection organizations, the, um, at the, the, the people interface to the technology and making that so much um, easier. And, and disintermediate, disintermediate, decoupling the technology uh, from, from, from the interface. So, so actually I want to connect to all of the potential places that um, a, an artist could upload their music to, for instance, like SoundCloud or iTunes or whatever, and make it like one button, publish, boom, you know. Um, and, and to do that, what, we've been playing with quite recently is we need to build an, an API client library. So a, a kind of a library of code that would know how to interface to SoundCloud to, 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 to all these other areas. Um, and I've been talking to other companies who are service providers, service providers to artists who want to have a bunch of artists that they then um, uh, represent. And um, they need that, those connections too. And then I've, I, my question is always thinking it will be a no, the answer will be no. Do you need to own the code that you, um, that, that facilitates you connecting into SoundCloud and, and all the, other systems you want to connect them to, and they say no. And they say, "Well, can we do? Can we build it collaboratively together, open source?" And so far, I mean, I've only spoken to a few about this specific thing. I mean, I've been speaking to a lot of companies over the years, but specifically this, the results are positive. So we actually have more people coming on board that will contribute to a code base, an open source code base, and that's uh, so. I'm kind of super excited about that, really, as well. So, so. It's 
what I want to do is build uh, an application that can run on the desktop or on a laptop and also in the cloud as a website. Um, and also connect into third party service providers and with a, with a bunch of plugins that are, that are collaboratively maintained. And also the front end is also a pluggable system as well. So we're looking at different technologies that, that will allow us to do this. And I'm open to more totally. Uh, that just, um, and I, I guess but the fact that we've got this resource of, of funding is, is a miracle and it's awesome. And, and I really want to offer it out to people that I know are doing awesome things as an opportunity to, you know, use, you know, it's an opportunity for us all to actually make this, this world come alive. Yeah, I know that's enough at the moment. Fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Um, I'm going to try to keep it short, compressed. <laughs> um, Scepter is a thing that we're building, um, short for Receptor, which is basically kind of a, re, a rebuild of computing architectures. That's a big visionary project. It has self-describing protocols and it's all open source and it's a receptor is a virtual machine and they're fractal. You can have virtual machines inside virtual machines and blah, blah, blah. But that's not primarily what I want to talk about because that tends to be um, too far beyond people's reach right now. One po component of this is um, the way multi-instance receptors synchronize with each other. And we've broken out that component into a separate thing we call Holochain. And we're focusing right now on Holochain because blockchain is entering people's awareness. It's becoming more widespread. And you have many people that are now trying to use blockchain to create new social patterns. But blockchain's roots are in trying to run a monetary currency. So they've got it all locked down in certain ways um, that you don't need to lock it down to run a distributed Twitter or a, you know, distributed Slack type of thing, or right. You, you don't need the same levels of, um, of security and processing. And it's not that you don't need data integrity and security, but I think the, I think people miss that the, the, the particular power that blockchain has unlocked for people is separating data integrity from data access, right? That it's no longer about, you know, to keep the database safe, we're gonna lock it up behind a firewall and keep it in servers behind locked doors and man traps and biometric, you know, sensors for getting into the rooms and, you know, blah, 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 which is the way it is for banks, for example, because otherwise, you'd love to log into the bank and change your bank balance to be $5 million or whatever, right? Like, yeah. um, so we've, we've collapsed data integrity, keeping people from messing with the data with data access, keeping mm. people out of the data. Mm. What blockchain has done is allowed us to have data integrity while also having data access, having different people holding the data, but they can't tamper with it. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But, there are other approaches to this. So Holochain is our approach to this, and it is a, what we call it is a, a, um, a data engine for distributed apps. So it's a, it's a data integrity engine, basically, for distributed apps. You build your app on top of this, we provide the crypto services of keeping things in local immutable chains. So each of us would have our own chain. If we have a distributed Slack, we have our own chain that we're the only ones that can write to Nobody can write, nobody else can write to my chain. We share these things to a distributed hash table, which is already a known and proven sharing format, right? BitTorrent and all those kinds of things run on, on distributed hash tables. Distributed hash tables are easily sharded, broken into pieces. So everybody only has to hold a little bit. So you can think of like running Wikipedia. If everybody who used Wikipedia 
hosted a dozen pages, you know, then you'd have thousands of redundant copies online and you're only having to everybody hold a little piece, you know, and it's not that you have to hold the 120 gigabyte blockchain or, you know, take six weeks to get in sync with the Ethereum chain or, you know, things like that. It, um, it's, it's, you can join at any time, bring, you, you replicate your piece. It's an organic kind of, of structure. In fact, all of the, the point of these things in Scepter and Holochain is that we are modeling these things on, on the principles of nature, the design principles of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, like um, the cells in your body all have the same instructions, the same DNA, but there's not a global ledger that they're tracking their, their state changes with, right? You know, that's, that, that's crazy. That, that's just an, an, an absolutely inappropriate architecture to allow autonomy. If independent agency, if for you and me to interact, we need everybody else's consensus, that just simply doesn't scale. That's, that's a wrong-headed approach. Yeah. Um, even though it was a breakthrough on some of the things mm. that were previously there, there's mm. many levels for us to go. And uh, it's so great to hear, Daniel, the, the things that, that you're talking, the way you're talking about the stuff of, you know, open mm. protocols and mm. decoupling the user interface from the, from the engine behind it and being able to have the data live in multiple places or, you know, like, uh, because there's so many people coming into this kind of consciousness and trying to build solutions in this space. And, mm. you know, every time I hear you and many other people talk, I'm like, Oh yeah, that's exactly what sector's for. And we've got that piece and we've got this piece. Yeah. We don't have these other pieces yet. And you know, it's like, we're close. I'm so hungry to be able to actually like get all of this out there so that people can, can yeah. use it. Cause there's so many people that, that want it, even though we don't have shared language for it. People don't, don't know the, how to name what they want. Right, so right now the, the, the name in the space is blockchain. Mm. But what, what we're doing is, um, is building this as, as a general computing system. So right. more, like, more like Ethereum than Bitcoin, um, yeah. Yeah. but it's not monolithic, right? Like all the smart contracts wanna run on one Ethereum blockchain. In the case of Holochain, every application has its own Holochain. Mm -hmm. And the whole that a holochain is comprised of is source chains for every agent, for every node, for every person who can change things, sharing with the DHT. That's what makes it a whole, right? It's, it's many parts tied together in a particular architecture, um, but it's its mm -hmm. own address space. Another app is its own address space. And so... Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, and then the interesting thing about it is that one of the ways that those apps can interact is through the agent, right? So I have my distributed Slack installed and my distributed Twitter or whatever, right? I can bridge through me something from my Twitter to my Slack, but it comes as me in both spaces. So the bridge is actually through my local installation where one thing can talk to another as me uh, using my keys that, that validate my identity and sign it rather than having things in an abstract way, talk with each other and try to manage all the permissions that might be involved with everybody in one space, trying to interface with something with everybody in another space. You, it has to interface as me in both spaces. And then I'm the bridge. Um, and you know, there's just this, this isn't the way that we build things at the moment. And yet when you do it, it becomes so, so natural and easy. It like solves problems of uh, complicated problems of permissions and security and stuff. It makes them suddenly much simpler. And anyway, I'm, I'm really, really <laughs> excited about, excited about that. Um, um, I'm, I'm, can you hear the echo? Or is it just me? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Yes, I'm, I'm really excited, especially in terms of, well, both of your work is really intersectional with mine, uh, but the piece around identity is so important and, uh, and how we actually create that the systems to be able to, 
from the code base, from the bottom, uh, in terms of how things are built. So I'm really excited, Arthur, to hear. <clears throat> I already knew some of that, but just when you spoke right now, uh, the penny really dropped in terms of that architecture to be able to hold our identities in an autonomous and sovereign way. Uh, and yeah. yeah. If, uh, if I could just say one more thing about that. One of the first applications we're building on Holochain, we're building some, some initial applications that we view as core because many applications will want to piggyback on them, will want to use those services without having to build them themselves. And one of them mm -hmm. is a DPKI, distributed public key infrastructure, that also ties in with identity services and, and such so that you know, in the example we were giving about a, a Slack group or whatever, I could, um, you can say, I am this identity in this, in this distributed public key infrastructure, right? And give me a token to access certain of your credentials that validate you, that show me your name and email and whatever, you know, or if I'm an employer that show, shows me your name and email and social security number and citizenship, proof of citizenship and whatever. So we just, you just unlock those things for me with a token that gives me that access. And then if I, if I, it's, it's the Slack group is closed, right? Every, every holo chain is a private holo chain. You have to get an address in that space and be acknowledged as a peer in that space. Now you can make it super easy, kind of like, getting an IP address. To talk on the internet, you have to get an IP address, right? So it doesn't have to be hard, it can be really easy, or you can have to validate an identity type of thing. So you can say, I am this identity out here, I can look up things that validate you, and then I can also see your, your public key, and I can encrypt something using that public key and send it to you, to you when you join, when you install the software for our little Slack team, send it to you, and if you can, decrypt it and provide me the right response, then it shows me you are, in fact, that identity that's out there on that other system without us even having to build an interface to that other system, right? Mm. Like, it, <laughs> um, if I have the DPKI installed on my side and you have it installed on your side, I can just look it up locally and, you know, and um, we don't, it, it just solves so many of these problems for bridging. It's the kind of problem we're trying to solve where, you know, you go to a website and they send you an email to validate your identity or whatever, but email, who knows who's in control of your email account or, you know, whether this is any kind of useful identity or, so you, you get to set the thresholds of identity that matter. You know, you can be running something that is very pseudonymous or fairly anonymous or doesn't validate identities, or you can be running a currency that actually gives credit limits and, and, you have to go deep in identity and show me your business financials your, or whatever, right? So for me to extend you the credit limit, and that's part of the, the identity process. Mm. So. I've got some questions and so shall I, I was just gonna go for it. Okay, so um, what's happening mid-September, I've got the kickoff meeting of the project and um, I want to go there with just a, a really good plan it's not going to be written in stone because they'll or they'll all have their really good plans too. But um, the, the project is something along the lines of blockchain and personal media, and um, but that's all. It's it's quite malleable. But, but basically, there is blockchain in it. But as I think we can say, blockchain is is a is a term that could be walked into other blockchain like things so i'm not i'm not stuck on that at all um so, so what i want to do is go there with a really good uh set of directions and and um so so part of my remit is to find the technology that we that, that i'll propose you know find the platforms that i'll propose and and, and um and so even if stuff isn't completed yet, it's kind of like um, it, we can work at overview level or we can work at, hey, I've got some, I've got an infrastructure framework that I can actually plug in right now. You know, I mean, the, the, the app that I was talking about, it isn't, it, it's built in prototype 
so far. It's built actually using Drupal, but I will probably want to move it totally into some sort of Node.js type type thing scenario, like Electron. I'm, these are buzzwords to me because I haven't actually worked in this environment before, but you know, something that is same code as server and app, something that is a, a sort of uh, run on, runnable or, on, or makeable for multiple platforms very easily. Um, my aim is to get users using this very quickly, so to produce something that actually works very quickly, um, that, sorry, that, that does something useful, like uploads it to SoundCloud or uploads a song to SoundCloud or something. Um, so my questions are around, you know, I was talking about the API client library, stuff like that. What I, I, what I know I'll need to do is like have an out, outward going information, inward com information coming back, I'll need to normalize it. I'll need to map between different data structures and different functionality. So I'll need to build some sort of framework that allows that to happen within the app. Because the app, the app has, actually has to be a standalone thing. It's, it's got to be serverless. So it could be, it could, there could be a server if, if, the, if the user wants to back up or sync. You know, you can sync with, I want to sync with five multiple sources just in case this one dies, you know, I've got it all backed up. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for, yeah, technology recommendations. And also like, if, if you're gonna to say to me, yeah, well, we could plug into that then, yeah. I'm not gonna be able to say, I'm not gonna be able to get people away from saying we need to do this on Ethereum. But, I, but I, what I think we can do is like say, well, let's do it on Ethereum and something else, you know. And so far I've come up with, Let's build the whole thing on Ethereum, one. Two, let's have an app and then have Ethereum plugging into it. And then three, let's not build it on Ethereum at all and let's just build that functionality in using different architectures that are not so nefarious, maybe. You know. Any thoughts? <laughs> um, yeah, it's... I guess I have a couple questions and I'm still processing. This is part of mm. growing, growing the pipe. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I do see, maybe what we'll do is just talk about where we're at right now. I think that's a great bridge where, where you left us, Daniel, uh, just in terms of where are we at? You're, you are in a, you know, building towards September when you're going to have your first meeting. Um, mm. I'm uh, wanting to be of service to create media that helps teams and people and communities be able to see themselves and share what they're doing and, uh, and collaborate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really excited about you guys and being here and being able to actually, you know, kick the tires and, and uh, um, feel what it is to, to, to do that. Um, and, and, yeah, so I'm, that's where I'm at. I'm here, I'm willing, I wanna do as much of this kind of work as possible and assist in making two things. There's one is connecting people and looking at what we do together, but there's also making it understandable for, for the common people. So that's, those are two of the places uh, uh, where I think we need, we need help. Um, as a movement is to see, you know, that human interoperability, which means language, which means, uh, you know, under, try, working towards understanding and where things are relevant and what that actually looks like. Uh, I would say, Tammy, as well, just you have ideas as well. So that's the third pillar that you have. Then. Yeah, so that's yes. Good. Yes, definitely. Thanks for that. Uh, so maybe... Arthur, you can jump into where you're at. Um, so where we're at right now, Holochain is um, built and functioning pre-alpha. Um, we are starting a milestone right now of security functions um, where um, we, haven't, we haven't made sure everything we're always signing every communication. We want to be able to put in place end-to-end -end encryption. We, there's a bunch of things that we, we want to put in place before 
we actually even call this an alpha release because Holochain is something that I think it's going to be in the, in the blockchain neighborhood, people coming to this space, many of which are, are kind of crypto heads, right? If we don't have all of these um, security features in place, they will be likely to, to dismiss it. So we're not even calling this an alpha re release until we finish this security pass, which will hap which should happen this summer. Um, we actually just started it um, and there's, a couple dozen tasks in there, um, development tasks in there to, to build. Um, we've gotten some funding, which is new for us. We have been uh, in one of those kind of mad scientist open source projects where just a couple of passionate people are really kind of coding on it. And then it's got like a little team of people that are, that are the, that are talking about it and, and getting some word out there. And then we've got like this little, crowd of fans that are followers that are like, well, you guys hurry up and build that thing. Um, <laughs> but um, we've gotten some funding. So we are this summer, like we have a sponsor for some residency programs and we're going to have a couple of pods, one in Albuquerque and one in San Francisco, where we're going to have a handful of people, one pods, developers building things uh, like the DPKI and, and stuff like that that I mentioned earlier. The other pod is going to be um, more media communications, um, actually being able to talk about this stuff because we haven't been the, the best about that either. Um, and uh, as of just a couple days ago, I'm hesitant. I'm hesitant to say this because it's not really decided yet. So we we have been planning in the longer term to do a kind of um, currency offering you know, like Ethereum and many other people have. Um, but we were intending to do that on our platform with very differently structured currencies and all of that kind of stuff. But just in the past couple of days, we've been considering moving that up and doing a, sh doing a shorter term one using Ethereum or something like that for the initial tokens. And then they would convert to the thing on our platform um, just because the, the, the ICO space is booming so much right now that I fear that a lot of people are, a lot of these are gonna kind of go south and then regulations are gonna get much you know stricter. And even though what we're intending to do is different and I think at a much higher level of integrity, regulators can't see the difference. You know, like we just ran into this, part of what the kick in the pants for me was, is that we, um, we incorporated a, a new clean entity um, scepter and went to go open a bank account at a bank that I already have accounts with and you know all this kind of thing and uh, they did not approve our application because the word blockchain was on our website even though we're talking about where it's actually a criticism of blockchain and talking about you know the bottlenecks of it and the, but because the word blockchain was on our website they actually declined to a bank account for us and I think we're, we're a software company we're not actually making the currencies and all that kind of stuff that's like saying Apache and they said it looks like you're in the business of doing monetary transactions we're like <laughs> that's like saying Apache web server you know like Apache is in the business of doing monetary transactions because banks have websites <laughs> like they're they're so far off base with that assessment but they don't have the eyes to see it any clearer mm -hmm. I'm concerned that that's what's going to happen with the whole ICO space. So we're looking at moving that up and doing a coin offering much sooner mm. before that space gets shut down and right. hopefully create a new pattern that can outlive it when it does get shut down, that they'll be able to start seeing the differences if there are some of them there that are different. Mm. That, that where. Yeah. What's, I, what's ICO, Arthur? I'm sorry. It's, it's an initial coin offering. Okay. It's a play on initial public offering, <laughs> like when a company goes public. And it's the way that a lot of these projects capitalize with the community, okay. finish building the technology and get it out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole boom of these cryptocurrency coin offerings happening. And some of these projects are, frankly, um, not very impressive. 
you know, it's like you read a white paper and it's like, somebody just ought to build this kind of thing, you know, there's a need for it and they sort of, but and we have some ideas about how to mash up these other things and maybe that'll work. And so give us, you know, $10 million, buy, buy $10 million of our coin for an anonymous LinkedIn or something <laughs> like that. Like, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think you're confusing how to mash things there or, you know. So um, just to, that's, first of all, that's ridiculous and interesting and kind of crazy. Uh, and I have a question is, were you approaching a bank or a financial cooperative or credit union? You, or do you, yeah, which, which do you bank with? Oh, it was just a normal bank. It was an internet bank. Okay. Um, and a bank that focuses on online services being available. Um, I'm already in conversation with Scott Nelson, by the way, about your credit, the credit union you're on the board of as a potential thing if we want to have a, a, a footprint in Canada, in case that's what you, where you were going. Um, Just in terms of cooperative finance, you know, yes. in, in terms of living our values, yes. part of the reason why, thanks for bringing up that I'm on the board of CCE. Yes. Um, and which stands for Community Congress for Economic Change. Uh, so, I mean, it's a, it's a neat little credit union that's really come from the co-op self-help activist movement. Uh, so it's, it's a neat little institution. But wherever you are in the world, uh, really you should consider joining a credit union rather than a bank so that you're not in that system of extracting value to shareholders, but rather a collective ownership of the assets of the organization. So just in terms of living our values, I recommend going to a financial cooperative or credit union, wherever you may be. So that's my little piece of advocacy in there. Yeah. Um, it's been a couple years since I did this research, but I only found one credit union at the time that had reasonable non-local online services. Yeah. Um, and being an, an internet company, you know, that we, we, we kind of have to be able to operate that way. And so many of the credit unions are behind on that, that it, it's challenging. But I totally agree with what you're saying. And um, I like that you guys have even begun to focus on serving some of these um, new, econ new economy type of um, projects in Canada. So, it's in our mandate. It's, yeah. it's really in the DNA of who we are. So yeah. that's exciting. Um, so one thing I didn't mention in terms of where my work also intersects is in as an example, I see myself as an example of a person that wants to be in, uh, in the economy differently. Uh, so I have also working with media and working with digital assets to be able to, uh, to be able to create some protocols and share what I would need. So I see myself as, a, you know, one of the roles that I can play with both of you is, is really looking at what some of those useful protocols are in terms of me in my life as a human, as well as others, you know, not, I'm an example of someone who wants to create media content and have different uh, uh, rights management around it and be able to uh, participate uh, collaboratively and work in that space um, and feed into uh, what it is that we create together. So I, I just want to offer that as, as part of um, where I'm at is wanting to define some of the user, some of the use cases for these kinds of projects and protocols, not only with both of you, but also with others. That's great. Could I talk about rights management really briefly? Yes, please. Um, so our plan with Scepter, the bigger project, is to be able to turn that over into what we call a sovereign accountable commons, which is our alternative to a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, it just has some differences in, in the architecture, but basically a, a, a digital entity that manages itself, that governs itself. Um, we would like to be able to turn the software and all of the products in that software ecosystem, sort of like if you think about it like the um, 
the Apple iTunes store or the, you know, Google play store, or that kind of thing that uh, over to a, a self managing commons. Um, but our stuff is a little bit different than, than music or media, you know, it's, um, it's code and it, it has a lot of similarities in that it's also composable and mashable and you can sample from things or, or, you know, be able to excerpt from things, be able to construct things from other, other mm. creations. Um, but it's, it's also used in different ways. And part of, I mean, we're big fans of the open source movement and all of our stuff has, has been open source up to this date, but we're working on another license that uh, at the moment we're calling, the, the working name is the Human Commons License. And the idea is that all of these things in this commons are available to natural humans, <laughs> but uh, for free, um, but not to corporate entities or, you know, basically non-human entities that, that, that um, put themselves in as a layer to basically strip people of the rights of their identity and ownership of stuff, right? So if you're a, if you're a small business that doesn't want to buy a commercial license to something you, and you, you want to run this using it, the human commons license of having all of your employees just use it as humans. Great. But that means they're using their identity. They own what they produce. They <laughs> and, um, great. That's absolutely fine. If you want to take those rights away from them and become the mediator of those rights, then you pay for a, a commercial license. Um, or rather, you have to access it through a commercial license, even if for some period of time the commercial license is free. And it probably would be for some of the underlying basic protocols and everything, but what it does is it puts you in the category of commercial license. So if you are a commercial license user, so if you are sharing your work into that commons and you want to charge for people who are using it under a commercial license, it's already been made clear what is a commercial license or not, right? That's one of the things that's confusing in the space. And we are trying to make for our purposes, one clear definition of that. And, um, and to, to, you know, it's, Anyway, I think that's, that's enough. Uh, I've, I've coined the phrase, I don't know if I did coin the phrase, but I, I've been using the phrase glass Trojan horse. So basically it is a Trojan horse, but you can see into it. So you know that you're accepting this package. You know it's going to alter your life, but you're still accepting it into your life. And, and I love that, that, that you basically, yeah, well, you can use this for free, but you have to give everyone freedom in order to, you know, in order to use it. It's awesome. Yeah. That is so exciting and really solves a lot of a lot of those problems. I especially love your your piece around differentiating between uh, natural humans and people under the law. And in fact, I see that as the critical issue that we need to intervene with in terms of where we are in the world today, uh, because essentially all of our resources and power has migrated to non-human entities. And I see great value in creating that, that same ability to create value and participate with the economy for regular people. If we had that, it would be a complete game changer. If we can create value in our communities, if we can uh, have, because the ability to create value right now at the highest level in terms of currency is in creating debt that creates this cycle of, of, um, of diminish, diminishment. Uh, that's not the way the world is. So I'm really excited uh, that you have thought that specific piece through because that is a critical place of intervention in developing new systems. Yeah, it, it's about rebalancing that playing field, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, it, it isn't balanced mm -hmm. and yeah. I, I wanna um, talk about, I'm not a huge, advocates one way or the other um everything that we're doing is open source um because we're non-profit and we just see it like that and, and it's also it's a, an advantage to getting people involved but um it, what's interesting is when we start talking to artists as, as in recording artists 
who need to earn a living, and traditionally that's what they do, they don't, they're not going to just necessarily give all their stuff away for free. And so what, what I'm really, and it's interesting when you come up, some across some very evangelistic open source advocates, and I'm not saying that any of us are, um, that there can be a kind of a, a bit of a clash. And, um, and what I'm interested in, in that conversation is allowing both scenarios to happen and for people to play around. So having a system that basically facilitates people to charge if they want to wrap it up in a huge, um, contract, uh, um, yeah, yeah, contract or, or, or license if they want to, and also not. And if it can be done on the same system that they can have it offered for free or offered for a lot and really wrapped up in quite heavy um, uh, a license, then then they can play around. Well, I'll just try this track for free and then see what happens. See how many more, or this track for a, a, for a lot less and then see, see if, or, you know, like no license attached and just see or pay what you want, you know, and then see what I get. So you can experiment. The problem with the current system is that to play around with, with, with different systems and different licenses, it's just difficult. And, and, and artists, people creating content that we want to see here, um, don't have the t- brain, the bandwidth to do that. So that's, that's another part of, of this is just to let people play with different systems and different, different architectures and different, different models, different business models. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's do a quick time check. Uh, yeah, you're, I know you had something, Arthur. Do you have a few more minutes? I do. I, I have like 10 more minutes. Okay. So what we wanted to go through is where does our work intersect, which we have been in. Uh, how can we specifically help each other? What roles do, uh, will we play? And who else needs to be in this conversation? So let's see if we can do that in 10 minutes. Okay, I wanna smash on through on that one. Dude, <laughs> how do we integrate your stuff? You know, um, like, like I say, I have, have some resources. I have, um, uh, you know, you, you know roughly the model. It's an app, it's, it's an interface. Um, I, it, obviously, we're not gonna do anything exclusive because it's just gonna be pluggable, but I wanna, so, so there's, there's the high level architecture, the kind of not even tech, not, not even code that you've kind of thought about and created, which I think is very aligned with what we're thinking, what I'm thinking personally. Obviously, other people, I will have to connect into the blockchain, you know, that's that, or whatever, Ethereum, and that's fine. That would be good as a kind of a something. But also, I want to have other things going on. So it's a three year project. So we've got some time. And I, I guess it's an invitation. We have some resources. And, and, and like I said, I'm having conversations with other people that have more resources. And I'm going to be going for yet more money, more funding as I possibly can. I'll probably end up moving to Europe and basing Kendra out of Europe because then I can get, because when Brexit happens, we'll probably won't be able to go for EU funding anymore. So, or we'll set something up in the US as well and get, and get more money that way. You know, just to say, aren't you in Europe? <laughs> well, for the moment, for the moment, God knows, who knows? I don't know. We'll probably always be in Europe. Who knows what it is? It's there Europe is means, Brexit. Yeah, Europe means Europe. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, um, just just briefly in answer to that, um, one of the things I forgot to mention that we've uh, been building is uh, a scaffolding engine for apps. What that means is, it, think of it as a wizard. Nobody knows how to write apps for Holochain, mm. right? Nobody knows what the different components are. And we can, you can read a bunch of documents about that if you want, but who likes to read documentation? Mm. Yeah. So we are making a web interface that is essentially a wizard that asks, that asks you some questions. You basically are putting in information. It builds the big JSON blob, big, big chunk of data, self-describing data mm. that then you can download and um, then the Holochain um, engine eats that JSON blob and barfs out the files and stuff that you need so that you basically have um, built somewhere between 80 and 95% of your app that way. 
Okay, um, cool. Now, when I say your app for Holochain, that's all about the distributed data integrity stuff. Yeah. That yeah. is not your user interface. Now, no, some sure. of these things have some default user interfaces, but this is about being able to, to basically have this be operate in a completely distributed peer-to-peer -peer manner and have all the data, va data validation rules and cryptography and everything and logic and interfaces, and data structures that are needed to do that. And then you still need to build a UI on top of that. But the yeah. UI is loosely coupled with, yeah. with the data engine. Right, and the the data engine becomes um, more fixed. Um, like you can't just make tweaks and changes to the rules because mm -hmm. everybody's running those rules, right. and then they have to basically adopt a new set of rules, and then you have to get everybody moved over to a new set of rules and that kind of thing. But we expect that to be much easier with Holochain than it is with smart contracts. Are you versioning the protocol, like a versioning a set of rules? Say, okay, we've moved on to version two now, so everyone knows that it's not the same, so no one's going to get confused. Is that how you're kind of doing that? Yes, but the thing is, so in, like, if you look at how that's, this has been done in smart contracts in the past, right. you can put some governance into smart contracts and voting or things like that. But um, generally speaking, the idea of a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain is it's kind of written in stone. Yes. You change it. You can yeah. make a new agreement yeah. and have the people participating in the old agreement agree to move to the new agreement. Yeah. That's kind of the only option. Sure. sure. Um, this is similar. Mm. Except that because it's completely peer-to-peer, -peer, not everybody may, may opt to move. Some people may continue to operate in the old mm. agreement. Mm. And not only that, but it also may, may allow other people to say, hey, we have a new version and we will accept your state in the old version. And so it allows for a more organic ecosystem because it is people really do control their own data and make their, they have their own autonomy. And so one of the things you can do is you can mark your chain as having ended in this version and having moved to this new version. And then that chain is basically dead. It's just like a Genesis block, but this one is a closing block, right? Uh, your chain here is basically dead and it points on to where you've moved to into this new application. Um, but that you have to get people to do that. It's not just a, um, and, and we, and we may have the, we may figure out a way to have the installation process sort of automatically do that. And, um, but it's, it's very much the model that, that I've been thinking of is that it's up to people individually to yeah, to, to, to that everyone's autonomous. So, yeah. so you, you, it's you, my data, I'll, you know, I'm going to do a diff against all my friends just, just to check that they're still representing the contract that I thought that we should be, you know, the, 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 the contract that we should be all agreeing to. You have that checking built into Holochain. Awesome. Like that's... Awesome. Yeah, yeah, awesome. That's what yeah. it's doing. Yeah. Right. So what I'm excited about is art. It sounds to me or it feels to me like what you're creating is the bottom of what uh, Daniel is going to build on top in a sense, exactly. and that you guys being able to uh, collaborate through that, this phase of the development where you're, you're both, where you're both at is really exciting. Uh, and I'm excited to be, to play in that space as an example and, and to also bring other examples into it of how it can yeah. be used and make it understandable. So in terms, so, yeah, go ahead, Daniel. So what, what, okay, I'm choosing staff now. So I'm, yeah, uh, this is something I'm, it, it, it's, the other companies, you know, have 200,000 employees, 80, 80 employees. They, you know, that's the smallest to the biggest. So they, they're huge compared to us, which will be around like a couple of full time and maybe a few part time. That, that's it. So the skill set that I choose is really important because I won't have the resilience to go changing. You know, I need to, between now and September, I need to have, I need to have thought this through a little bit. So in terms of compatibility, in terms of mindset, you know, like what are you coding this in? What, what skills should these guys or girls have that will, and, and this could be, you know, your stuff, or it could be, this is you as a developer, help, you know, like what, what, 
what give me some advice generally and also specifically to using your stuff um i think the short answer is javascript right um, we're not building in javascript sure we're building in go the underlying engine is compiled in go and part of why we switched over to go is to be compatible with a bunch of the other spaces and uh, projects in this space like ethereum we're using an ipfs we're using the lib p2p library um yeah. for communications peers to talk to each other that that ipfs created and that ethereum is now adopted and so we're we're trying to have part, as much of our system as possible be play nice talk well sure. with these other things and we're using the same hashing algorithms and multi-hash addresses and that type of stuff so that there's as much compatibility as possible but just like there's an ethereum virtual machine that yeah. runs the solidity you know smart contracts or other other languages like that we have virtual machines on holochain and there's not only one at the moment there's two and there's so there's one that runs JavaScript, so you can write your application in JavaScript. There's one that runs Lisp, uh -huh. so write your application in Lisp. And um, there's somebody working on one uh, for Ruby. Okay. Um, cool. But it's not a full-blown, it's not a full instance of the language. It's a, it's a virtualized instance that's running in a virtual machine inside of the Go holochain. And then, but the so, key thing is that if you write that application in JavaScript, yeah. everybody, Every peer is running that same set of rules, that same application inside their virtual machine and their Go installation of Holochain, right? So it just activates that in the virtual machine. Hmm. So maybe not Kendra, but other people are in the consortium will be doing a lot more um, uh, uh, blockchain work. And so um, would you suggest for the you know for the guys that I employ at least that they're not at least scared of go you know that that wouldn't that would not be a bad thing because you know the more i mean i've been actually been told not to get or to, to get developers who are kind of like multi-talented effectively because yeah um it, it's always good to get yeah. you know people that are that are frankly not religious mm -hmm. about their language or platform yeah. but that are, are yeah. able and willing to switch between yeah. one easily yeah it's not always easy yeah. to find. Um, yeah. And yeah. I would su suggest that with our scaffolding engine and the yeah. fact that we already have the alpha release out and everything, that if you're launching this <laughs> in September, that you could have the data engine for this in less than a month. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. that, that you, that, that like bringing somebody who's never heard of a holochain but knows yeah. how to program in JavaScript yeah. through the scaffolding engine yeah. and have your your, yeah. So the data side of this running in less than a month, you still need to be, build user interfaces, sure. but part of why the user interface is loosely coupled from the data integrity engine is yeah. you can tweak that stuff forever yeah. and it doesn't change the rules that you're managing the data integrity by. Well, that's awesome because what we need to be able to do is, is get something built rapidly, maybe in a couple of ways, maybe in Ethereum or maybe, you know, maybe Holochain, you know, just and just as kind of proof of concept. So, so that, if it's a month, then awesome. Then I can just say, "Hey, look, this is what this is what it." So you know, whether we rip it apart and build other stuff or whatever, it, it's that. That's really awesome news that, that you think it could be done like that. that and, and then I can show that and actually demonstrate that. that that's great. Yeah. Another yeah. piece with that is that on the P two uh, P Foundation website, uh, Art has posted a, a piece on interns for the summer program. And mm. so in terms of what he's working with, all that is written up, Daniel. Uh, right. so you have a read on the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation site for that. Um, and uh, I'm conscious of our time. Well, can, I just, can I just ask, um, uh, Arthur, what, what in terms of, is there stuff that you think we could contribute back? You know, because I will have these resources, you know, and people will be working on this stuff. And if I say, listen, guys, we need to look at this. Do you want me to do that? Or, you know. Yeah. Well, um, how I look at that is, is yeah. everybody who builds an app on Holochain is contributing to the ecosystem. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. In terms of validating it, proving it, testing it. Yeah, um, yeah. Cool. The other part is if you can think of the thing that you're building not as just one big monolithic Kendra hub, yeah. but but as what are the parts that other media systems or other things like that might use and being able to break those into reusable parts would mm -hmm. allow others to mix them in to yeah. the things they do. And yeah. so thinking that way helps the ecosystem grow in, in the mashable pieces that people can pull together. Yeah, yeah. It, the, 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 the one thing I'm not totally clear about yet is we're gonna, you know, like I said, we're gonna have to have APIs to a lot of different services uh, or API clients to a lot of different services. So that, you know, send stuff to them, bring stuff back like sales reports or, or you know, like, like Spotify, YouTube, you know, what have you, what downloads have we had? And I'm gonna have to mash them all together. Is what kind of, again, I'm kind of looking for libraries or, or kind of more common ways of, of doing this where we can have, um, I guess we'd have namespaces, schemas about the, how that data comes back and then mapping it onto each each other. Is it, it, it obviously using semantic tools or possibly? I mean, I just wondered if things come to mind. Is it? Yeah, we, uh, you know, if we had full blown scepter going on Holochain, we would have all those semantics. For and, sure. <laughs> for you. Uh, we haven't um, re implemented. The stuff yeah. that we already built in the Scepter repository in C, we haven't re-implemented yeah. that as a separate project in, in Go wow. for the semantic trees and uh, mm. um, the self-describing protocols and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, mm. But we certainly, because we've built that stuff, have suggestions about how you could approach right. it. That's not all built into Holochain yet. You know, you know, it may just be that once we're going or that, that we have some discussions and, and maybe it's just a bit of brain brain drain that, you know, and you tell us what you want for it. I, we, I don't. I won't have cash, but I'll have resources. You know, um, and, and you know, maybe, obviously, we. You know, we. It would be that we would want to work, build stuff using Holochain and, and and so forth. So and then, make it worth everyone's while. <laughs> well, it's a value when it's being used. So that's yeah, part of, that's part yeah. of what uh, mm. I think drives us all. Um, in closing, who else needs to be in this conversation? Um, I was everyone, yes, but in terms of, uh, you know, what people, if we can think together, and maybe this is a little bit of offline as we consider, it would be great if we can review what it is that we've done and, and uh, today, and, and mm. there's definitely next steps for us to land on. Um, so Matt Slater, Matthew Slater, uh, some of the work that he's doing, I think is really would be good to touch in on at this stage. Um, he's also been a, a real proponent for interoperability and is, uh, he has a, a recent paper that I haven't read yet, but I, I did see on online. So he, he might be a person. Uh, there's a, it would be interesting as well to, there's a lawyer that I was thinking of, Daniel, in terms of your work that's local here. Uh, her name is Martha Rands and she's uh, a, a lawyer in digital rights. So she might be interesting to touch base on uh, in terms of, um, well, I can reach out to her and see if she's interested in feeding into uh, this kind of next level digital rights pieces. Perhaps I, I kind of I guess I'm for the moment I'm concentrating on team setting up business and um, uh, you know we're going to be creating something I think all of us will be that is very flexible and so whatever the law needs to do the law can do you know and 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 it's not to say we're going to ignore people like that but I think that they're not necessarily the first people we want to get on board. Um, I guess my concern really is literally, um, you know, I've been in, in development situations before and generally it's quite smooth, but I just really want to make it so smooth. I just, so I'm just trying to do as much preemptive stuff as possible to have all the tools ready to, 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 to just, so we're using the right kit. So, you know, so we're using as much of the stuff that's going to be, um, understandable and explainable to 
third parties so that they can get on board really quick. Yeah. Um, that, that, that's where I think my, so this conversation is really great. And I think that, that, that you know, it's other conversations like this at this level where people have done the thinking behind what it is to have an, a peer-to-peer um, system like this where, where people are t- autonomous. You know, what does that mean? So I think um, those kind of people uh, definitely, and it doesn't have to be related to currency necessarily. Yeah. So, um, and also that maybe you have some funding as well, <laughs> you know, well, as, as Arthur does, so great. And in terms of that, uh, there's another woman, Joy Case Van Hove, that uh, I'd love to be able to share this with, with her. Um, she's been, uh, she's, she has a couple of projects that are relevant, um, including a crowdfunding project called Fund It TV. So she's, I think, I think she would be definitely interested and I'd love to see if she wants to come into a conversation and participate. Great. I'm, I'm funding. Sounds good. I'm, I'm, my previous three projects, I've been quite, um, just concentrating on the project, but this time I want to, I've been saying to myself, I want to fundraise for three years. So I don't just want to be doing the work on the project, I want to be getting more and more projects going. So when we hit the three year mark, we are actually just like snowballing with, with, um, cause actually having funding, well, that sounds a bit crass is, you know, that that's where, how we can get people paid and, and work done on this. Yeah. I like eating. Uh, yeah. And uh, is there anyone else that you think uh, is, it's a good time to bring into the conversation, Daniel? Well, I can uh, just the uh, Lynn and Bob springs Bob to mind. Lynn. Yes, that's Bob right. and Lynn, Lynn and Bob. Um, you know that they're still doing. I'd still on that um, Git repository, and stuff is still happening in 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 the value, uh, particular value stuff. So worth checking in with those guys. Great. Now I'm also conscious, Arthur. You said you needed to be gone, so uh, maybe we can just close this off with. Uh, who else needs to be in the conversation for you? Or do you have ideas? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Like, what, I'm, I'm trying to think of, of people. I feel like I'm talking to the people I know to talk to mm-hmm. about this. Um, you know, one of some of the needs that we have, I can't give you names, but like uh, people who really are... Um, DHT experts, distributed hash table experts on, on all of that. Like we are building a new variant of a, of a DHT, a validating DHT that's also a graph database and that type of thing. And so we're, we're like changing some patterns and things that would be great if we had some people that had experience in that space. So we're not just kind of fumbling around in the dark. Um, I don't know. That, that's the that, that, that's the largest need thing coming to mind at the moment. Where like is a domain of expertise that we don't really have on our team at the moment that I know we need. Okay, great. I just had a thought that that um, much how we first all met up. Well, yeah, my my introduction to you guys was you know like let's all have a meeting, and um, I don't have the budget that that we had in Impact Economy, but. Um, uh, I do have some, you know, budget, and I and I am tasked with creating events that where we can fight, you know, liaise with industry. So what I what what I and what I actually want to do is not just have three, which is in the project plan, but have loads everywhere, co-locate with 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 conferences. So, but using that momentum, perhaps we can raise more money to get more people coming together to have these huddles where we could have those experts and actually do a bit of hackathon slash yeah mostly hackathon actually I don't presentations not but you know conversations yeah 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 and I love presentations (laughs) yes collaborative presentations so thank you all so much uh, for your time today there's lots to continue to talk about and I look forward to our next work together so thank thank you awesome